everyone, welcome back to another edition of the SBK Betting Podcast, coming to what feels like in the depths of the winter as the jump season is properly in full swing. And uh, we're going to get into some really, really good action this weekend with TC and Ross joining me now that I'm, I'm back in Blighty. We've got Wing Canton, Aintree and plenty of other betting to preview but we need to look back on last weekend we had two um, individual podcasts to preview both the, the jumps action also a fabulous uh, renewal of the breeders cup and i'm pleased that um i left uh, the guys in capable hands and were very much on the ball because ross uh, looking back on what was quite a brave selection last weekend in the charlie hall and what a battle and gentleman's game taking down brave man's game and um, both similar na namesake but brave man's game wasn't brave enough when he wanted to be and it was gentleman's game who was able to do what uh the horse in second couldn't do and just got there on the line seven to two um he was put up as and uh that's a race that needs to be rewatched and rewatched plenty to pick out of pick from out from there at uh, tc you had um botox has who won the west yorkshire hurdle at 15 to 2 and then uh, we had a separate podcast on the breeders cup which was a, a wonderful weekend's racing i know it is tc it's your favorite weekend of the whole year and i hope it's delivered for everyone and august rodin who you think was um pretty good value i'd imagine at three to one i agree with you completely going into that as well and we spoke before uh, we came on to record that we unanimously agree that was probably one of the best bits of race riding that we've ever seen from Ryan Moore. Three to one, he delivered in uh, the Launching Breeders' Cup turf. And then big, big Invasion, he put up 20 to one, was second to no balls in the Breeders' Cup turf sprint. So uh, all in all, before we get back into the jumps racing, TC, did your weekend that you look forward to all year, did it give up, bring up to all your expectations? Yeah, it really did. I thoroughly enjoyed the Breeders' Cup. We also had Elite Power, the Nap going, and Aesop's Fables each way. So it was a very good podcast. Hopefully you guys watched it as well. The lay was Morge, so again, a little bit fortunate there, but she also got beaten. So it was a very good Saturday. Friday, not so good, but that tends to be the trend that I have punting-wise when it comes to the Breeders' Cup. Anyway, you know, the two-yard races are always harder, but Big Ebbs was the storyline. And yeah, I mean, the whole two days of the Breeders' Cup was just thrilling action. I was in Saudi Arabia, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed your coverage, actually, on uh, on YouTube. Yeah, thank you. It was it was, it was brilliant. It's great to see our um, best of our jockeys, our trainers, all on that world world stage, and our jockeys, William Buick, you know, Tom Marquand, but Ryan Moore just showing why they are at the top of their game. Frankie as well, and the news that Inspiral is going to stay in, tr in training next year makes me wonder more whether we're going to see more of that man um, on our home shores because he will find it very difficult to see Inspiral partnered by anyone else. But Ross, we have finished the flat season. I can absolutely and say to you that that's that now now we can focus on this on the jumps game and maybe we'll just touch on br briefly gentlemen's game um taking down brave man's game what did you make of the charlie hall what have you made of the first opening bit of this jump season because we do have a, a jump season special that's going to be recorded imminently but i've just seen alaho win in slightly workman like style over in clonmel all the big guns are coming out what are you making of what they've showed so far uh, I think there's been a few upsets. I think there's certainly a few of the bigger yards yet to really hit their stride. I wouldn't be convinced by the form of the Paul Nichols yard or the or the Dan Skelton yard, which would be two of the bigger yards in the in the country. Um, I was very surprised to see people so negative about about Brave Man's game, and it's perhaps slightly odd that I'm the one defending him because I've been against him most of his his career. I thought he lost absolutely nothing in defeat. I thought they were very brave to run Brave Man's game on that ground because then they sort of avoided it where they possibly can um i think he just got out out stayed by a by a horse with race fitness on his side who loves that ground he's a horse that doesn't love that ground and it was his first run of the season he wouldn't have been cherry ripe for that because they they want to go and win the king george again and and we know year on your year paul nichols brings his horses through so i th i thought he lost nothing in defeat um i'd be surprised if either of them were contending a gold cup i have to say um, but I thought it was a good race and it shows you haven't got to have big fields to get good races. And just before, as we get into the season and all the Irish start saying that the reason they're so competitive because they have big competitive fields, we just watched Alaho have an absolute freebie round Clonmel to, to win that. So that sort of pours cold water on that idea. But again, I, I enjoyed watching Alaho. You watch different races, different reasons, don't you? Is Alaho back? 
can you see a chink in him? No, he sort of seemed to get the job done nicely enough on, on desperate ground. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. And three runner fields at uh, one of their biggest days is is probably a little bit disappointing. So um, I I I'd say that, but for those reasons, you want to see a proper horse race. And if you do, does it matter? Um, now, with that in mind, with what you're discussing, Paul Nichols and whether his horses are just needing the run, and I've heard Harry Cobden saying that one or two of them have done. Will that be? the story or the outcome of, of what we'll see this weekend, because we are focusing on, on Wynn Canton, then we'll get into Aintree, but Wynn Canton will be first because it's going to be a massive, massive day for the 60 second running of the Badger Beer Handicap Chase. You've got um, good racing supporting that as well, but Wynn Canton being Paul Nichols, the champion trainer's local track, it's also going to see the return of Frodon, who won this uh, Badger Beers last year, an absolutely phenomenal style under Bryony Frost. Um, with 10 stone they've already announced that this will be his final year uh race um in race riding and that this will be um essentially his sort of bit like frankie Dottori, his victory uh lap year you like to hope or his retirement year maybe there might be a win that will come from it but this is his race this is his gold cup um which he showed last year he's back off the mark the same mark that he won off uh this time last year um and it's whether the case that this Frodon a year later, does he still have the legs for it? Is this as a tougher race as it was last year? He's got a stable companion three under through five, who's definitely got that class edge in here, um, having his first run of the season, first run after wind surgery as well. And then it's kind of a case of, you know, what do we have? trickling through my opinion was that it sort of lacks a little bit of depth and there are a few horses with that dreaded uh, letter rather than symbol when they last saw them um sort of completing the the top um, echelons of the market so my opinion is that it's probably not the greatest renewal but ross we'll start with you first does that mean that it's uh, a another nice opportunity for, for frodon or will it just find him out slightly with that you know, being the age he is now, and importantly, it being on soft ground this time around. Yeah, I mean, you, my heart is absolutely with him. I, I'm sure most people saw the, the the piece he did where he went to the to the primary school near Wincanton, and all the kids came out. You know, so so from that point of view alone, and I'm a bit soft like that. I just love to see him do it, but the soft ground is is not ideal. He is another year older. Um, and time, unfortunately, catches up with, with them all eventually. If he's going to win a pot, it'll be this. Um, I think Paul Nichols are taking a run to come right. I can be certain that Froden will be absolutely cherry right. They won't be able to get him any any fitter. Um, and then just the other concern for me is is the, the presence of Gustavian in the, in the lineup. He's a really free-going front runner himself. And I could just see him not letting Frodon get into that nice rhythm, which he, he got into into last year. Um, so much as my heart will be with him, my head has to say I go against him. Quite what you go against him with was was a bit of a question, really. I, three under three five is is not a horse I got an awful lot of, of time for. Um, you have to say the McNeil horses are shaping better this year for trainers being able to use their own jockeys after they part the company with Adrian Heskin. There's 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 no malice in that at all. It is just a cold hard fact that horses that perhaps wouldn't have won under him have won under Sean Bowen and Harry Cobden this season already. Um, the big breakaway are having the same bracket. I just think he's slow and awkward, and I don't I don't see three miles around Wing Canton sh suiting him. Certainly, Red was a horse that I thought was was interesting, and he certainly got some ability, but Watching him up the straight at Wincanton, the, the couple of times he's won there, he sort of seems to go all over the place, you know, drifting left and drifting right. And given that Frodon adjusts out to his left, I thought that could perhaps put a bit of a spanner in the works, certainly red. So the one I've come down on, and it is fairly tentative, is, is Sam Brown. He's going to love this ground. He's not got top weight because of the presence of Frodon. So for all that he's got a, a high mark of 152, he's actually not carrying lumps and lumps of weight. Um, he's previously won a handicap at entry, a grade three handicap at entry off a mark of 150, 147 and won that by 15 lengths very comfortably. He was going to win at the Punchestown Festival, I've no doubt about that, off a mark of 150. Um, and this time last year, he was four lengths behind Brave Man's game in the in the Charlie Hall. So I think Anthony Honeyball can get him fit at this time of year. He is a better horse generally on on better ground. I think he's a better horse on a slightly flatter track. Um, 
I think he can sit in behind the pace and I, and I expect there to be a strong pace and he does stay a bit further than this. Um, so in a race where eyes will be drawn to Frodon, uh, if it doesn't happen with Frodon, I'll be, I'll be willing Sam Brown to come through and um, pick up the pieces. Out of interest, being someone that you know knows horses and knows about giving confidence to horses, what would you hope to see or what, what do you imagine they've done to sort of ensure that this horse hasn't lost his confidence from two quite heavy falls in quick succession? Yeah, and, and I haven't seen Sam Brown schooling, but Anthony Honeyball is very good. He puts up a lot of footage of, of them schooling on the grass. But he's also got a really nice indoor setup and does a lot of pole work with his young horses. So you would imagine that he's had the perfect storm there because he's got a nice lead horse in Sam Brown to give the, the young horses plenty of jumping practice. So I would imagine, and certainly would have been my idea, that Every time there's a set of poles out, Sam Brown is popping over them and just taking it nice and slow from the moment he comes in, just popping away, doing sort of baby exercises and, and building back up would be the ideal scenario. And, and given that Anthony Hannibal clearly puts a lot of value on schooling young horses, um, I'm sure that's what's happened. Yeah, they obviously have taken the blinkers off after having them on for the first time last time. And he was actually travelling quite nicely in them and then he fell with them on. So they obviously think that he probably... There's sort of there must be some sort of happy medium there somewhere and <laughs> just get them out, use the confidence of jumping. But maybe sometimes Blinkers has just sort of cross, made him too claustrophobic when he has been out out on the front. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, possibly. And I also wonder whether with the passing of, of time through the season, he needs a little bit more motivating to actually go racing. I think perhaps first time out might be the, you know, generally first time out is, is a good time for him. You know, that run last season in the in the Charlie Hall was a, was a good run. Um as the season goes on, he perhaps becomes a bit harder to predict. And maybe that comes down to perhaps him not putting his best foot forward at all times. And that's perhaps why they reached for the for the blinkers, which, as you say, did seem to work until he until he took that heavy fall. Yeah. OK, this is it's a tricky one, isn't it? It's but every jumps racing in general is tricky at this time of the season. Tom, when you've got horses that are coming back off a layoff and it's trying to work out who will, will, will go well fresh and who will be as I think Ross is quite much rightly mentioned, be primed for this. It's a long old season. It's soft ground. You don't have a hard race at this stage. So probably not the easiest race to work out. No, not the easiest. Uh, I apologise in advance because I'm going to echo most of what Ross just said there. But um, Frodon, again, I'll be cheering on as a neutral, but I don't think he'll win the race. Um, he's 11. He's carrying 12 stone. The ground's gone. Uh, I also think he's on the decline as well. And, you know, maybe he's not come... Uh, into this race as good or anywhere near as good as last year. And if that's the case, at the price, you have to oppose him as a like with the punting head on. The big breakaway, I think, is the best horse in the race, but he just can't jump. And by my rule of not backing a horse who fell last time up, I literally cannot put money on him. Um, and like you said, I don't think there's much strength in depth in this race. And that kind of leaves me on three under three five. I actually really love the switch to Harry Cobden from Adrian Heskin. And there is a bit of malice in my opinion. I don't think Heskin's very good. Uh, meanwhile, I think Cobden is the best jumps jockey right now in England. So uh, I think that's a huge and noteworthy switch. Uh, hopefully that will have the desired effect. And albeit he might not be as primed as Frodon or go as well fresh as the big breakaway has done in the past. What he does bring to the table is a phenomenal record in non-graded events um since 2021 he's never run in one but prior to that he ran in nine non-graded events in his career won seven of them finished second in the other two so he has a phenomenal record um i'm hoping that harry cobden's going to have the the desired effect on him and, and three under three five is going to be my play okay interesting yeah fair enough also am i right am i going mad to think adrian heskin has also switched over moved to ireland now Ross is nodding. Yes, I, I haven't seen him a huge amount. I, I th say it's probably a tricky old limbo period, but I think it's fair enough to to point out how much of a difference it would make, especially for a horse who has had its quirks. How much confidence a jockey like that, Harry Cobden, who's so good at measuring his fences, so good at you know his t timing and his judgment, will just give to a horse like that. Because I think we know going back to his was it his no novice days? He was a very he was a good good horse as a novice hurdler. Yeah, it was right. He, he was buying Vanillier and that was at the Albert Bartlett. And it's just not been able just to follow through since Harry Cobden, just looking at his, has had one opportunity to write, write him in, um, in all his starts. So um, interesting horse in this. Just a bit of a shame, I think, that Paul Nichols 
other horse was to win this when this is clearly the Frodon day. And I think in the spirit of good stories, which we love to see, that really puts a real hug around racing. Um, we've said it. It would be lovely to see Frodon win a race like this. I'm putting up the fact that I mentioned despite the ground i think that this he will be perfectly tuned up for it whereas all these other horses i'm just thinking this is a good prep run for something the weights have been slightly compressed he did this off 12 stone last year he's too he's back to the rating that he was when he won this i don't think it's as good a race i'm slightly con conscious now um, as been mentioned by ross that gustavian might just make it tricky for him up in front and uh, make him just think about it out for the lead but look in a race that's not going to take a huge amount of winning, a horse that absolutely loves it around here. You know, Frodon loves Cheltenham. He also loves, thrives at Wincanton. And he might just drift out a little bit in the betting. I can see support coming from, from some of the others. Let's hope it's a dry Friday. We're recording this on Thursday for Frodon. So the ground will just be on it, on it, on slightly the better side for him. Um, but I'm happy to be there from a sentimental point of view and from a price perspective as well. So Frodon for me, three under three, five for TC and Sam Brown for Ross. Um, and from Badger Beers to another good looking um, handicap, it is the Grand Sefton at 2.45 at Aintree, run over the Grand National Fences. 11 runners declared, um, which is maybe a little bit disappointing. Um, I think I'm just trying to remember when Jess Gill, who's the current favourite, ran in this race this time last year where he was a short head second 14 runners so i suppose pretty much much the muchness but i think that's the story of the race the horse this horse just gill was oh he was cruelly denied really wasn't he, he ran an absolute blinder um arguably is coming into this in, in a better vein of form he's now what is it five pounds higher um the team that uh, um, trained this horse Greenhorn and guero are absolutely thriving at present and we saw a very nice horse um, in the shape of Morocco win over fences for the first time this week. And look, he, he seems to be one of the other flag bearers. So what's he got to beat from a betting point, point of view? You've got a fantastic lady for Nico de Boyville and Nicky Henderson, um, an Irish challenger and born by the sea. Cooper's Cross, um, who was a, a very good second in the Scottish National when last seen, um, and the likes of Nassalam um, in here as well. So lots of horses well known. Um, I think I always think when I look at this, Ross, maybe who's going to enjoy themselves with the, with the challenge of these fences um, and, you know, who's well handicapped in that sense. And I think you must feel like just skills at least improving, whereas some of them, maybe they've got to the limit of their ability. Uh, how do you rate him and his chances? And, and are you with him or are you against him? I'm against him because I don't see him improving. Um, I thought his, his standout run last season was in this race and he did not an awful lot after that, including in the top him over course and distance. Now, the ground was maybe a little bit quicker in the top him than it was in the Sefton, but not not all that much. There was a bit of rain around that day and it rode it rode slow enough. Um, he, ha he had made a nice comeback in uh, at Ortoy in a listed chase and had soft ground there and did look good. You know, you have to have to concede that. Um, Henry Brook is riding out of his skin this season. He's head and shoulders, the, the, the best jockey in the North for my money. Um, and uh, Green and Guerrero are going along really well. But if you like him, sure, you've got to like Percussion, who's £10 better off for just eight lengths last year. Um, and I'm just not sold that Jaskiel is is going to stay this trip on on this ground. I just have it that, you know, when he tried a couple of bigger stamina tests last year, he was found wanting. Um, and at the price, he's just short enough for a, for a race over these fences. Fantastic lady. Again, I don't see her getting home. She... She looked to me to fail to get home in the in the top him, albeit perhaps if if Nico had his time again, he would just take a pull after jumping the last rather than committing. But this more testing ground is going to see it a more stamina test for her as well. I liked Cooper's Cross. Um, I was actually in the airport waiting for a flight the other day and did a rambling on on Twitter about anti post selection and and he would have been it at the at the time. But he was fourteen to one. Now he's significantly shorter than that and. For all that I think, if he handles the soft ground, he's the horse with the proven stamina, you know, second in the in the Scottish National over four miles. Um, but you struggle to find bits of form where he, he really wants soft ground. He was going well in the top and when he came down 
um, certainly wasn't out of it at that point and seemed to enjoy the fences. Nasalam, I'd be surprised if he took to it. He looks to me like he's a horse that thinks about everything he does. And I could see him taking one look at those and thinking they all look a bit big for him. Um, but Kaylin Quinn is, is riding really well and, and was a good uh, good servant to TC last weekend. Um, so the one I came down on is, is Frere Bamboo. Um, just because I think this horse has been crying out for this trip. And I know he tried it at Cheltenham, but Venetia's horses were, were badly out of form in the spring. Um, so I'm prepared to give him another try because it appeared at Cheltenham like he didn't want this sort of trip. But everything he's been doing at Sandown over two miles has been done in the in the depths of the post. He's a pound below his last winning mark, mark which came on desperate ground at Lingfield over two miles where again he just got up in the in the dying strides Venetia's in really good form at the moment 33 percent strike rate um, he's been placed off a mark of 142 um, so he's he's getting himself well handicapped now and Charlie Deutsch the fences don't take as much jumping as they used to but on soft ground I think it does take a real horseman to maneuver one round here and and he is a consummate horseman I think he's brilliant to watch um, so Ferreira Bamboo at a decent price will do for me. Yeah, I was literally about to say, what a great run of form Venetia Williams is having that age old. Well, the ground is heavy or soft. They've all come good. But I genuinely just do think she's got her horses. I think last year was quite tough. It was patchy, wasn't it, for her? Um, but she's got some lovely sort of, and most of them are ex, ex-French um, types. And I think that, you know, I always takes a little bit of warming up for me to get back into the jumps after such a long lengthy period over over the on the flat but when you see Charlie Deutsch riding in the style that he does with horses that really are so willing as well it makes it much more enjoyable so um a combination that I'm really going to look forward to following this year and I Ferro Bamboo was a horse that I would nearly fell down on um myself so um a good nice uh, case made for that horse who's around about 11 to 1 as it stands um you don't really want to be backing a horse at 100 to 30 for this race do you tom yeah i mean it's a great price as <laughs> as much as a horse can be a good thing over the national fences i think Eskil honestly is uh, and i completely disagree with ross on his case one he definitely definitely improved last year and actually is improved beyond if you look at his beach run, he was like eight pounds better than the Sefton run anyway. Um, and that just proves that he um, handled the, the course a lot better than uh, maybe people thought that could have been a fluke in the Sefton last year when he came back and proved it. He's done very well on very soft ground in France on numerous occasions. I think the ground will be absolutely fine. Um, the trip's great. If he reproduced his run in this race last year, he would win by five lengths, I reckon. And he's improved from that as well. He's going to be out the back early, which is never ideal, granted, because a horse could fall in front. There can be interference. But these fences aren't as big as they used to be. You know, you're not expecting masses of drama coming into the Sefton this year. Well, I'm not anyway. Um, so I'm hoping he's going to get a nice clear run round. And given he won at Otoy the other day and the fact he's improving, I think he's a clear standout. I'd be disappointed if he didn't win. Look, he got within a nose, basically, of Al Dancer last year. There is no horse in there of any kind of uh, Al Dancer calibre, not even close. So I'll take in Gaskill. Brilliant. Well, I can agree with you more. I think he's a, I think he's a likeable horse. He's seven, only seven. And to have done what he did at that high level at uh, this time last season, um, the horse is in great vein of form. I just, I don't know, you you, you know Valley better, probably better than I do. You know, I take your word for it. But I still think that's short. Do you, not, do you think that he'll shorten up as well before the off with all those all those aspects in mind? It's probably not going to be the biggest punting race, is it? So I, I doubt there'll be huge market moves in here, but I'd be surprised if he wasn't south of three to one, yeah. Okay, just skill then, um, co- real confidence and uh, um, and a uh, differing of opinions between our two men on this podcast. And don't forget, both were in very good form for their own reasons this time last week. So um, you, you take whichever view. Um, you could also take my view. Yes, I'm fresh off from uh, a lot of, flat racing, but I do really like Cooper's Cross. And even Ross has mentioned him as well. And I suppose the ground might be a worry, but he is laden with stamina. Um, he's a horse that will definitely be able to see this out. And as, um, and I'm not going to repeat what uh, Ross has said, but was seen running a very good race in the top and before falling. I think it was four out. And who knows what would have happened that day. That was on soft ground. So I do, I do think he'll handle it. Um, I think jumping normally, I think that was a real, you know, um, sort of 
a chink in his armor that doesn't normally is seen. Um, yes, he's a much shorter price. He always seems to be a, a, a big double figure price for races like this. But I think he'll be able to hold his uh, hold his own. Um, and I like to hope that he would go well, reasonably fresh. Um, of course, it's still quite well handicapped in the context of this race of a rating of, a, of 136. So I like uh, Cooper's Cross in here. So something for everyone. You've got Jess Skill, Cooper's Cross, and uh, we've also got Ferrero Bamboo for Ross. So that is... Um, the Grand Sefton, looking forward to re-watching and re be backing at entry um, to see a horse running over these uh, Grand National fences. Um, that uh, that will that takes us to the end of our previews of our main races, but we've got Naps and Next Best to get into as well. So difficult to separate who was on better form. I say TC, considering you had an absolute near enough. Uh, perfect clean sweep of your Breeders' Cup runners. So hopefully everyone's very rich uh, to to take away for your naps and your next best. Also had 22 winners from 36 in Saudi last week, but we won't go uh, there. Um, there so, he goes. Yeah. <laughs> Incontinental the, uh, man. <laughs> yeah, you're fresh off flat. So am I. I was coming through three predictions <laughs> all at the same time. Anyway, um, into the nap and next best. Uh, the nap is going to be Rubo in the elite hurdle, the three o'clock at Wing Canton. He's currently five to six. I hate tipping odds on horses, especially on a podcast where I could select any race. Um, but I think he'll probably drift out to odds against, or at least evens. And then he would be a bet. This is basically a match between himself and Hansard. Those two faced off last year in the Dovka at Kempton. And yes, that might be Rubo's track and not Hansard's, but Rubo absolutely smashed him. Subsequently, he came out and won on a seasonal reappearance this year. Hansard's yet to run. And although Hansard did improve dramatically when he went to the entry Grand National Fe uh, Festival, he didn't jump very well again. And that's got to be a major concern for me. So with race fitness on his side, I really like Rubo at around even money, hopefully, uh, when it comes to Saturday. Paul Nichols won the elite hurdle eight times as well. I don't think you should overlook that. Uh, and my next best is going to be a bigger price. And it's on the flat, on the all-weather. A horse called Sound Angela in the 130 at Newcastle. Um, this horse has been running in listed races all year, but only had five starts been relatively lightly campaigned and only one of those has come since July so there was a big mid uh, midsummer break for this horse obviously aiming towards the back end of the year maybe the, maybe she suffered a setback or maybe they're looking towards the all-weather races throughout the winter and I think it could be the latter because she's three from four on the all-weather so far if you go all the way back to her second career outing she beat a horse called Al Karim who's now rated 112 at Kempton and won decisively that day and of course Al Karim wasn't the horse that he is now, but he's still very talented. So beating a horse of that nature is credible. Then went to Lingfield uh, and won decisively. Then came off a layoff, went to Newcastle, this track, and won by six and a half lengths. Now, that race was against much inferior opposition to what she's facing here. So you cannot use that as literal. But she quite clearly handles the track. And albeit she's been running a little bit subpar, despite placing three times in, in listed races this year, I think the switch to Newcastle will see her in much better effect. For a trainer in Roger Berrien, who's got a 25% strike rate out the track. So Sound, Ang Sound Angela, around 7-1 to one right now in the 130 at Newcastle is my next best. Okay, brilliant. Um, to back up another one at Wing Canton, Rubo, um, for the Nichols team. Thank you, TC. And I assume they're both jumps related. Ross, what, what, what have you got for us? Yeah, I mean, no chastising TC for the all-weather selection. Like, like when you chastise me for throwing up your summer jumper, Jess. I don't think you did actually, to be fair, but I do think it was still we're still somewhere in the middle. I um, actually. What I will been... say, th <laughs> this meeting was supposed to be run at Donny, I think. So technically, this would have been a flat season end of end of year turf event, uh, and it just got moved to the all weather. So that's there my, we go. Uh, and, yeah. yeah, And while I'm still slightly in my flat mind, I'm just going to let it pass. But as I get more into it, there will be consequences for putting up all weather horses in the depths of December. Having said that, that's probably where I'm going to spend most of my racing TV days. <laughs> Go for it, Ross. <laughs> okay, so I, I have stuck to the to the jumps. Uh, two from Aintree. Uh, the nap is in the 210, uh, Twiston Davis, Master Chewy. He put in a brilliant uh, novice chase performance at uh, this course just two weeks ago. That was off a mark of 121. He's up 10 pound, but he slammed General Officer at Aintree last time. And although he's a maiden over hurdles, I think there's comfortably two lines of form last year where he's run to at least 130 over hurdles. Uh, he was going to win at Ascot um, and beat the likes of Persian Time. Um, 
that would have seen him around a 130. He finished behind Hansard, who TC's mentioned at Plumpton. Hansard's 140. Um, that puts him around 130. And he is simply a much, much better chase than he was Erdler. Um, Twist and Davis team were also not in great form last year. Um, so £10 is plenty. But he, he won with any amount in hand last time. And uh, jumping is the name of the game. If they take to jumping, it can be worth so much. So uh, the nap is in the 210 at Aintree, and it's Master Chewy. And then a, another novice chaser um, in the one o'clock is the next best. And that's Lucinda Russell trained Giovinco, um, who did very little wrong before coming down at, at Carlisle in what I think will turn out to be a very nice race. Um, he was progressive over hurdles last year finished his season uh, winning by 14 lengths at, at Perth from a 133 rated horse. Um, like I said, he was unlucky to come down at, at Carlisle. He didn't seem to do an awful lot wrong and sort of just got his legs in a bit of a tangle on the landing side and, and knuckled over. That was behind a very good horse to Sam Thomas's. He was going to run him close, um, providing all is well with him. I think he'll win the one o'clock at Aintree. Brilliant. Master Chewy. And say the game and say the name again for me. Giovinco. Giovinco as well. Okay, brilliant. So we've got a lot to look forward to this weekend, plenty of racing, and um, we've got some offers for you as well to help um, make that a little bit more interesting. You can place two £5 football multiples and get a £5 free bet, which is for Saturday and Sunday, which is available to all customers. But for racing specifically, you can place two £5 horse racing multiples and get a £5 free bet for Saturday, which is available to all customers. So with that in mind, thank you to TC to Ross. Let's hope the good form continues throughout the course of this weekend um don't forget all new sbk users get 30 pounds of free bets when you sign up and bet 10 pounds for the first time and uh hopefully you've been listening to this long enough to make sure that you've signed up and you're subscribed and you've liked and you told all your friends because we're in the midst of the jump season now we're going to have a jumps season preview coming up where um we will be getting uh, into the minds of TC and Ross to make sure we've got all of their uh, dark horses, their big horses, the horses to follow the rest of the jump season. So that will be incoming very soon. So make sure you subscribe. So that will be landing in your podcast library before you have to go search for it. So thank you again to the guys and we'll see you soon.